Well, good morning and welcome back. Thank you again to those veterans. Uh, I love that we live in a country uh, where we don't have to uh, worry about some of that stuff uh, that other countries do. I still think America is the greatest country in the world, uh, despite all of our issues that we have. But I'm excited, uh, actually excited about, we are in the second week of this uh, series that we're calling Harve- uh, Journey Through God's Harvest. Uh, it's that time of year in this, in this area. I know that uh, I love this, I love this time of year. I love every part, every part about this time of year, except what follows. Like, I hate the long winter. I hate that. I love this time of season, but then, uh, then we know that it's just a reminder of what's coming. And um, but uh, is anybody else surprised at how quickly we're, the, this year has gone? Is it like, I mean, I know everybody says that every year, uh, but like the older you get, and everybody tells me that too, like the older you get, the quicker they go by. Uh, it seems like that to me. Like I, I look at my grandkids and I look at my, you know, just my life in general. Uh, you ever notice like for, uh, is anybody, if you would consider yourself old, uh, you know, I don't, I'm not going to have you raise your hand. Uh, <clears throat> I would consider myself. I didn't, I didn't. I didn't think so until like you ever have this. I'm gonna, you ever have this moment where you're flipping through Facebook or something, and then you see somebody and you're like, "Man, they look really old." And then you realize it's somebody that you went to high school with, and you're like, "Man, is that me?" Like, uh, you know, I don't know if you've ever had that moment, but I'll like, I'll, I'll show my kids. I'm like, "Does this? How old do you think that person is?" And they're like, "I don't know, 70." I'm like, "I went to high school with that guy." Like, I, you know, I was like, so maybe somebody's looking at my picture going, man, I'm really old. I don't know. Uh, but very quickly, we are moving toward the end of the year, and we have these. I'm just reminded that we are walking. There's this rhythm, as we talked about last week. I think that there's a rhythm that happens in God's creation. There's a, there's a rhythm that we see uh, of life. There's this birth and, and this growth, and, uh, and then eventually we get to this point where we harvest, and we're sowing, and we're planting, and we're cultivating, and we're growing. And you see that throughout, like, nature. I mean, you don't have to expect, you especially see it uh, in this neck of the woods with uh, all of our farmers. I actually got invited to, to go shell corn, Nick. I couldn't make it, man. I, I, I missed my chance. I had an opportunity, and I missed it last week to go, like, drive a convoy. And I think it was just a part of a field that was not good anyway. Who's going to let me go? But no. <laughs> but I appreciate it. No, it was good. Uh, but I've been mindful. I'm, when I think about this whole concept and this rhythm, I'm mindful of what we're sowing, which is what we talked about. If you're just joining us or if you're just joining us online for the first time, this is what we were talking about. Last week, we talked about what we sow. Uh, the seed that we throw out that follows in different places and, 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 and how intentionally or unintentionally that we are sowing that. And I think sometimes we're unintentionally sowing seeds. Some of it lands in good spots and some of it doesn't. Some of it grows, some of it doesn't. And we talked about that last week. And there's this, uh, there, there, there's hope that we sow it somewhere. Um, but there's this, there's this mindfulness that as I get older of what I have been sowing in my life. I don't know if some of you are that are older too. You begin to think about uh, some, of the, some of the seeds that you have sown because Scripture tells us that we reap what we sow, right? And so uh, as you have kids or you have, especially when your kids begin to grow, you're like, have I sown the right seed in their life? Have I shown them what, what following Jesus looks like? Uh, and you begin to be mindful. And, and, and kids, this is why your parents are so annoying, is because we look back and we see what the stuff that we have sown and that's not good. And we're like, we really don't want to see you do the same stuff that we, am I right, parents? Like, there's, there's not a parent in here that wouldn't go, man, if I could go back and keep my kids from making the same stupid mistakes that I did and sowing some of the seed that I sowed. And so you're, as kids, you're, you think your parents are annoying uh, and you're like, why are they? Why are they on my case about this? I get it, my, like I get it. It's because we don't want you to sow some of the same seed that we've sown. And so uh, you become mindful as you get older, and you get. Uh, I don't know. Some of us are inching toward harvest. I don't. I don't know what that means, but. Um, but anyway, what kind of? And so I just. I, I think I, I start thinking. I'm not sure. Um, if you've picked up on this, but we're, tr- I've been trying to th- get us to think in that mindset with respect to our church. What kind of seed ha- ha- has been sown around here historically? Some really good stuff that has grown, and, and we've, we have, uh, we've been the benefit of the harvest of some seeds that, that people that, who are no longer here in this church at Salem Grace, uh, we're reaping the harvest that they sowed. And so I, it, as I get older, I begin to think about what's going to be here for my, for my kids uh, you know, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30 years from now, what's this going to look like for, for Tatum, you know, and for Lo- 
Logan, my grandkids. Uh, and, and, you know, some of us have been around here long enough that we've raised our kids in this church. And it begins to, you be, and now you're raising grandkids in this church and, it, and our great grandchildren in this church. I know some of the, I know there's at least four generations represented here today. So what kind of harvest do we want for our church, for our families, for our country, uh, for those that don't know Jesus? Uh, for those who think they know Jesus, but uh, really have hardened their hearts and they're not, they're not open to anything that, uh, new that Jesus has to offer. And I believe this growth cycle that we see in nature is no different than what we see in our church. Uh, churches sh- can sow all kinds of seed. We can sow good stuff and we can sow bad stuff. Uh, some of the seeds that we sow as a church collectively together as a body of believers falls a really good I felt like we sowed some good seed yesterday we I don't know how many I don't know where Carolines how many did we serve yesterday how are you 250 I don't know like uh, we served 250 people yesterday and met the needs of, of some of our people in our community yesterday at our food giveaway at 31 volunteers. That's the kind of seed we want to continue to sow around here. And I and we want to be for our community. We wear these shirts that say for and they say for others. But I wonder, you know, I just want to make sure that we actually are. So we so last week we talked about sowing. You know, we consider the soil of our soul and allowing the seed of the gospel to grow in us and and so that we bear fruit. Uh, but this week I want to turn to cultivating. And there's there's this concept of cultivating. Uh, And we know, uh, I think we know what that means. That word gets used a lot. I think the actual, to cultivate, it means to cultivate is to nurture, to help grow is the definition. It's to nurture something and help it grow. That's what it means to cultivate something. And we, and we, we see that term used all over in our society. Farmers cultivate their crops. Professionals cultivate donors. Uh, celebrities cultivate their image. Uh, when you cultivate something, you want to make it work better. And so here's the facts. We are subject to this natural growth process that is in nature. Uh, this rhythm that God has created, that we are sowing something. All of us, whether you're intentional about it or not, you are sowing something. Uh, you are sowing something out of, out, of your, out, of, out of your life. What people see from you in our community and about and on Facebook and on social media, you are sowing seeds. We are all sowing something. Some of it's intentional, some of it's unintentional, but we are in fact sowing. And then we're going to cultivate the things, uh, and we need to be intentional about what we're sowing. Uh, but we are cultivating things in our life as well. We are nurturing things. There are things that are important to us that we nurture, that we love, that we that we hold close, that we don't want anybody to touch, and we want to we want to protect it. And, and we're nurturing our kids and our families, and we have things that we are cultivating. But my question is: Are we sowing? and cultivating the things that will bring the harvest that we are looking for, which is for people who don't know Jesus to know Jesus. Ultimately, that's why we do this. It's, it's why we do church. We should all have that same mission, uh, that to cultivate and to nurture that. And I'm, I know this isn't anything new, but I think so many times we get distracted. And last week we talked about how uh, Jesus in his parable told that there are people that will come along and they will sow weeds among the tear. They will sow... Um, they will sow tares among the weeds, or basically they'll sow weeds in the crop that you're trying to cultivate and grow. There are people all around us and in in where we work or go to school, uh, maybe intentionally or unintentionally, will sow dissension. They will sow uh, bitterness. They will sow anger. They will sow unforgiveness. They will sow all kinds of things in this crop that we're trying to grow. And the same thing happens in the church. That stuff gets sowed in the church all the time, unintentionally or intentionally. By church people. Sometimes church people are the worst at it. We sow dumb stuff. We get, we get twisted about something that's silly. And anything like that is a distraction from kingdom-mindedness. Jesus talked all the time about being kingdom-minded. There is something going on that is bigger than Salem. There is something going on that's bigger than Salem. There is something going on that's bigger than America, people. There is something that is going on that is bigger than all the nations in this earth, and it's the kingdom of heaven. And if we don't get our minds right and get wrapped around that kingdom, anything else is just a distraction from that. Okay? And so we can get so wrapped around the actual about some things, and it's just a distraction from what Jesus is doing and wants to do in and through us as a body of believers in this community for this time. We, were all, we, we are all living and placed, and I don't think that's by accident. We were built for this time. Nothing happens by accident. There's a reason that you and I weren't born in the first century. 
There's a reason that we are born and living in 2024, and it's about the kingdom. And so I want us to get a kingdom mindset. And I want to acknowledge the fact that Jim touched on it this week. We had an election this week. Uh, I'm thankful for our freedom in the country that we live in that we were able to do that. The fact of the matter is, uh, let's be authentic, we're divided as a country. There are some of you in here that were absolutely thrilled about the, the result of the election. You were gloating, <laughs> and some of you were sickened and upset and frustrated and angry and full of disgust about the decision that America made. And, and I'll be honest, I was saddened by the reactions on both sides. And you know why that is? It's because we're not kingdom-minded. <laughs> we're country-minded. And let me just tell you something. There's something bigger than America going on. Some of you are filled. We cannot let those things divide us as a church. The church should be a city on a hill and a shining example of the reflection of his kingdom only. It's bigger than Republican kingdom or Democrat kingdom. And so with that said, I want to share some things that Scripture reminds us of what we should be cultivating in our country, in, in, in our community, and especially inside the walls of this place with each other. Today I want to highlight some things that church, that, uh, for our church that Paul thought. Now Paul, if you don't know who Paul was, uh, he was a Jew, he was a Roman citizen, and I'm, I, some of you know this, I say this all the time, but for sake of somebody that might be here that doesn't know who Paul is, he wrote most of the New Testament. Uh, he was a Roman citizen. Romans in the first century occupied Jerusalem. So Jews were under the rule of the Romans. It was a political thing. There were some Jews that were okay with it, kind of worked for the Jewish government, people that were tax collectors like Zacchaeus and Matthew and some others. And, and then there were some other people that just uh, despised the Roman government. They wanted them out. And there was this division in the culture. And so Paul wrote a letter to a church in Ephesus. And these, they were called Ephesians. Okay, and so here's some things that you need to know about Ephesus. Ephesus was this, like, city. It was, the, it was a very diverse group. It was very, you had Jews and Gentiles. And Jews and Gentiles were the equivalent of, of Republicans and Democrats. So didn't get along, okay? They had a hard time with each other. Jews and, Jews and Gentiles. And so this church in Ephesus was made up, it was, it was incredibly diverse. It was made up of all, all, all different kinds of ideas and ideologies and thoughts and understanding of Moses' law and uh, understanding of, of what Jews could do and what Gentiles could do and Jews couldn't. And, and they were constantly trying to figure that out and wrestling with that stuff. But here's the thing you need to understand about the church at Ephesus. They loved God first and foremost. This church put God and his kingdom above everything. And I mean everything. It was, they were kingdom-minded. Yeah, we got this problem, but we know that God is the head of, of what's going on. They placed their confidence in him and him alone. And, and the second thing that, that, we, that we know specifically about the, the people in the church of Ephesus is that they loved each other. They had this incredible love for one another that trumped some of the other stuff that was going on in their culture, maybe in their families, maybe among their friends. And so Paul... In this book, I would encourage you to go read Ephesians today. It's, it, it, it'll take you 10 minutes, 15 if you're, maybe 20, okay, 30 minutes if you're a slow reader, okay, like me. Go read it. I'm going to share some of that with you today in the time that we have. 
And the first thing that I really want to do, I really, all I'm going to do is I'm going to pluck three things out of the book of Ephesians that, that I think that we should be cultivating that Paul wrote in his letter to this book of Ephesians. So um, before I get to the first one, um, my, uh, just to kind of tell you, the first, well, let me just tell you the first one. I think the very first thing that we need to do and cultivate in our, in our community and in our church, especially here at Salem Grace, what I would love to ha- see happen for our church here is that we cultivate an understanding of the Father's power and who we are in Jesus. Now, some of you hear that and go, well, duh, we know God's powerful, but I think we lose sight of that. Um, I remember when I was a kid, actually when I was in high school, I got a job at IGA in Anna, Illinois, bagging groceries. I made $3.35 an hour. I was pulling it down. And I bought my first car uh, with my own money. My dad helped me, and I saved some money, and my dad helped me buy this car. It was some car that I'd found on the side of the road that was for, had a for sale sign in it uh, in Anna. It sat there forever, and I bought this car, and here it is. Uh, well, that was it. There it is. It's exactly what my car looked like. Has anybody ever seen one of those? No. Maybe. It was a Renault Fuego, okay? French made. French are known for anything but their cars, okay? (laughs) It looked exactly like that. It was the same color and everything. I had this 1984 Renault Fuego Turbo, okay? And I bought it, and I I would drive it around, and I just noticed that it was, you know, if you don't know, Fuego... In French means fire, so it was supposed to be fast, okay? Does that give fast to you? No, it does not. And I would drive that thing, and it was just a dog. Like, I could barely get up to 55 miles an hour. And I remember my dad was, uh, if you knew my dad, he could fix just about anything. And I thought my dad could do anything, Uh, but I was bummed out because I bought this car. It was a piece of crap. I could barely go 50 mile an hour in this dumb car that was supposed to be super fast. It wasn't, it was, it wasn't a fuego. It, was, it, was, it, was more, it wasn't a fire. It was more like a flicker. <laughs> I had the Renault flicker. Um, and so I went to dad and I was like, hey, can you, like, this car, it's just a dog, can't go fast. He, and he got to tinkering around, as my dad would do. And we found out that the catalytic converter was stopped up on the thing. So it was, it was struggling to breathe. And so one night late in, in my dad's garage in Anna, Illinois, we got a, uh, I hope there's not any uh, FDA here, but we just pounded the heck out of the car, just busted it all out. So it was just a straight pipe then, and so then it could breathe. And I'll never forget getting in this car, and, and it was a five-speed. It would press you in the seat. Actually, funny, fun fact about the Renault, 1984 Renault Fuego, it was on par with the IROC Z28. It had the same track time in the quarter mile. I was stoked. <laughs> My dad was a little bit fearful. But it, re, it reconditioned. And from that point on, I thought my dad could do anything. I was like, are you kidding me? I was bummed out. I was stressed out that I bought this piece of crap car and my dad fixed it. it so fun. It was a sleeper. I would leave Trans Ams in the dust with my Renault Fuego. It's a beautiful thing. And I think many of us forget or lose sight of who our Father is and what He is capable of and what He can do. Ephesians 1.19.20 says this, I also pray, this is Paul to the church of Ephesus, he knew this, He said, I pray that you will understand the incredible greatness of God's power for us who believe in him. This is the same mighty power that raised Christ from the dead and is seated on the right, seated him in the place of honor at God's right hand in the heavenly realms. That is who we serve. That is our Father. That is what we're capable of. I want to encourage you. If you're a follower and believer in Jesus Christ, cultivate that understanding in your life. 
I watched a video this week on TikTok, and it was a pastor, and I wish I could deliver it this way, but he talked about something like this. I think so many times we get wrapped around the axle or around what we feel or what we, what we believe to be true, but his word tells us something different, and we forget that. Take a look at this video. Who is Jesus talking to? His disciples. What ethnicity are they? Jews. What did they have in their possession? The Old Testament. So they should have known that according to the scriptures, that the Christ would come, that the Christ would be persecuted, that the Christ would be killed, that the Christ would be resurrected, that the Christ would reign forever. But instead of remembering everything they know from the word, they let their emotions eclipse the truth of what they know in God's word. And you and I are guilty of doing the same thing. How many times has something happened in your life and you let your emotions eclipse the truth of God's word? You feel abandoned, but his word says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. You feel when you're praying, he's not listening, but the word says he hears the cries of his children. You feel you're not going to be able to get through the season financially, but the word says we have never seen a righteous forsaken or his seed begging bread. You feel he does not love you, but the word says that while you was yet a sinner, Christ demonstrated his love by dying for you. You feel, but the word says. 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 And while your emotions are real, and while your emotions are legitimate, we cannot allow our emotions to override the truth of God's word. There must come a time in the middle of stress, frustration, hardship, depression, loss, where, man, we got this word will be stronger than what we feel in our heart. Isn't that good? That's so good. I needed to be reminded of that this week. I needed to be reminded of what Paul said in Ephesians chapter 1, 21 and 22. And Paul told the Ephesians, now he is far above any ruler or authority or power or leader or anything else, not only in this world, but also in the world to come. God has put all things under the authority of Christ and has made him head over the things that benefit the church. And the church is his body. It is made full and complete in Christ who fills all things everywhere himself. He is Messiah. He is counselor. He is teacher. (gasps) He is Prince of Peace. He is Everlasting Father. He is our Savior. He is our Lord. He is Yahweh. He is Emmanuel, God with us. He is Christ. He is the Lamb of God. He is the Good Shepherd. He is the Alpha and Omega. And He is Jesus. Don't ever forget that. He is in control. He has a plan. Paul goes on in verse 10. He says, in the plan, and this is the plan. At the right time, he will bring everything together under the authority of Christ. Everything in heaven and on earth. Furthermore, we are united with Christ. And my question is, are we? Are we united in Christ? Really, all of us together? I hope we are. I think we are. I want to believe that we are. We have received an inheritance from God, for he chose us in advance, and he makes everything work out according to his plan. That is so good. If we cultivate this understanding of who Jesus is, it will lead to incredible growth in our personal relationship with Jesus, in our relationship with our spouses, and our children, and our parents, and the people we work with, and the people we go to school with, and the people we can't stand. 
God has unlimited resources, and out of that we will grow. How do I know that? Because in Ephesians 3, 16 and 17, Paul taught this to the church at Ephesus. He says, I pray that from his glorious unlimited resources that he will empower you with inner strength through the Spirit. That's my prayer for us. Then Christ will make his home in our hearts as you trust him. Your roots will grow down into God's love and keep you strong. And may you have the power to understand, as all God's people should, how wide and how long and how high and how deep his love is. That's what I, that's what I want for our church. It's for us to get that and cultivate who he is in your life. And don't let anybody tell you something different. We have to cultivate that in our life. And I needed that this week. Sometimes I just needed to be reminded that God is in charge. This is his kingdom. So despite everything that you see around us and despite the anxiety that you feel, and, and I know some of you are facing some difficult things, he is in control. And you can rest in that. The second thing is this. I think we have to cultivate our relationships and the unity that we have with each other. Paul told the Ephesians in in chapter 4, verse 2, he talks all about unity. Go read it. Here's Paul's advice to the people at Ephesus. He said, always be humble and gentle. Be patient with each other, making allowance for each other's faults because of your love. In other words, Paul's like, cut each other some slack, will you? For crying out loud. We're all, none of us are perfect. So let's give each other some slack. Making allowance for one another's faults. Why do we do that? Because we love each other. Verse 3. Make every effort to keep yourselves united in the spirit. Binding yourselves together with peace. For there is one body and one spirit just as you have been called to one glorious hope for the future. This is one body. What we do here, it's just, it's a collective effort from all of us. Let's give each other some stuff. Stop busting each other's chops. Let's start building each other up. I believe we do a pretty good job of that around here, honestly, at our church. We're not perfect by any means. We're authentic. But I I also believe this. I believe that there may be someone that you need to find after church and say, you know what, I'm sorry. (laughs) I've kind of held some animosity toward you over this thing that you said or I saw you posted or maybe. What would happen if we had a church where we were just open with that? And we begin to love each other. And then when somebody comes up to you and says they're sorry, don't go, well, yeah, I know. I was waiting for you to apologize. <laughs> Just say, hey, I forgive you and I love you too. Let's keep going. Let's keep rowing this boat in the same direction. In the same manner that God has forgiven us, we should forgive others. We have to consistently be cultivating the relationships in this body of believers if we have any hope of reaching those who don't know Jesus. If you can't get along with the people sitting with you in here, Lord, help us. That's the second thing we need to be cultivating is our relationship with each other. Get in a grow group. Go to lunch with each other. Go to El Rancherito. I'll see you there. The last thing is this. Uh, Anybody have any idea what the biggest criticism of the church is? Take a guess. Hypocrisy. Thank you. Yep, you're right. Hypocrisy. That's the biggest criticism of of, of the church in general as a whole in America is that people on the outside look on the inside and go, they're a bunch of hypocrites. And, and, and so a hypocrite is this, a person who acts in contradiction to his stated beliefs. Um. As a follower of Jesus, and this is the third point, and I'm almost done. Paul thought this was important to tell the people of Ephesus. He's like, hey, remember who, who God is, number one. 
Let's love and care for one another, number two. And then let's live like we, let's live like we know Jesus. Let's make sure that our life, Monday through Saturday, looks like it does here on Sunday. The biggest problem the church has is it, it are people who are professing Christians or professing followers of Jesus Christ, and then they go and live like hell on the outside. As a follower of Jesus, how can we authentically reflect the life of Jesus in our lives so they don't actually? Here's what Paul told the Ephesians. And I love, his, I love the words Paul chooses here in this first verse, uh, at verse 30. He says, and do not bring sorrow to God's Holy Spirit by the way you live. So what we should do is we have to ask ourselves, am I bringing sorrow to the Holy Spirit with how I'm behaving and how I'm living outside of this place? Remember, he has identified you as his own, guaranteeing that you will be saved in the day of redemption. And then he goes on in the next verse, and he kind of gives some practical advice for us. Get rid of all bitterness. If you're harboring bitterness in your heart today, you need to get rid of it. Rage, anger, harsh words, slander, as well as all types of evil behavior. If any of that is going on in your life, Paul is telling the Ephesians, hey, y'all need, to, y'all need to find a way to get rid of that. That is not reflecting Jesus. Instead, be kind to each other, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, just as God through Christ Jesus has forgiven you. So, my advice is let's check ourselves and our lifestyles. We can't claim to be followers of Jesus and behave poorly. Our lifestyles should look like we love Jesus. How we talk, how we behave, how we respond to needs in our community, and how well we forgive each other. C.S. Lewis said this, when, we, when Christians behave badly or fail to behave well, we are making Christianity unbelievable to the outside world. When, when we behave poorly, and, and, we're going, and we're going to, we're not perfect, I get that, and I think we do a pretty good job of this as our church, but let's cultivate our lives uh, in a way that reflects Jesus. You know, I, I've, always, I've, I've made a couple attempts to plant a garden in my life. Um, Jeremy and Olivia are good at it. I am not. Uh, I usually plant my, my uh, crops wide enough that I can just mow down the rows. Uh, <laughs> that's my... That's my uh, <laughs> It's my idea of garden. If I can get them wide enough that I can get the mower down the wo- to, to, to mow the weeds, then I feel like I'm doing a good job. Because uh, most of the time, the weeds are taller than my crop. And I think we can do that as followers of Jesus, too. I think sometimes our weeds are taller than the crop we're trying to grow. We've allowed stuff to infiltrate our lives. We allow things into our lives. We haven't cultivated the right relationship. We haven't cultivated the right understanding of who Jesus is in our life. And if you don't do that, your weeds are going to be taller than your crop. Um, I'm going to ask Jeremy to come up here. And I think in a minute, Jim's going to wrap us up. Um, I know it's a challenging message. And I always feel like I'm beating you guys up. I don't want to, I don't want to beat you up. I want you to be encouraged. I want you to be strengthened by the fact that we serve an incredible God. And I don't want us to lose sight of that. Because that's exactly what happened to the church of Ephesus. Paul wrote them this this letter. And they were doing, they were, they were, they were getting some things right. They were diverse. They loved God with all their heart, soul, and mind, and they loved each other. But then if you roll around to the book of Revelations, which is the last book of your Bible. It's a tough book because there's a lot of prophecy and a lot of symbolism, and it's, it's kind of a hard, hard book to read. But in the first several chapters of the book of Revelations, there are letters that John transcribed from the Holy from, from God, Jesus. And Jesus had instruction for, for seven churches. The very first one of them that you'll read in Revelations 
is Jesus' evaluation of the church of Ephesus. Here's some things that he said. Verse 10. It was on the Lord's day, and this is John actually writing this, the book of Revelations. And I was worshiping in the spirit. Suddenly I heard a, a, a behind me a loud voice of a trumpet blast. It said, write in a book everything you see and send it to the seven churches in the cities of Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. And John did write the letters from God to all three of those churches. And, they, and, and here's what's cool about the letters. It's, part of the letters that he wrote to each one of these churches, there, were some, there was like, hey, attaboy, you're doing, you're doing this really, really well. But then the Lord had, had some criticism for some of the churches. Ephesus was doing some good things, but God's biggest problem with them was this. It's in Revelations 2, chapter 4. Here's what the Lord said about the church at Ephesus. But I have this complaint against you. You don't love me or each other as you did at first. That was God's complaint against the church at Ephesus. And I can't help but wonder if that wouldn't be the complaint for our church. Hopefully not. Maybe, I don't know, maybe it'd be something else. But I think that's an important one. You don't love me or each other like you did once upon a time. He goes on in verse 5. Look how far you have fallen. Turn back to me and do the works you did at first. If you do, if you don't repent, I will come and remove your lampstand from its place among the churches. There are consequences for us allowing anything but kingdom mind us to enter our hearts. As a church, as a people, there are consequences for that. And so the main message of Ephesians is that believers in Christ are reconciled not only to God, but to each other. So we are to maintain unity of purpose within our families, within our church, while resisting the temptation to fall into sin of the surrounding world. That's what we're tasked to do. And I just want to encourage you today that we serve an amazing, incredible God. Let's serve him like we mean it. Let's cultivate that understanding in our heart this week.